Our scriptures today are from John, the first, 316 through 24. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who, who, who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit that he has given us. And from John 10, 1 through 18. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter into the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs, by, climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. Well, good morning again. I'm going to start by echoing Michael's uh, thoughts during the prayer this morning. We have a good congregation and wonderful people here, and I'm just like Michael. I am very, very pleased to be here and to be with everyone. So... One of the interesting things about brethren theology, or at least sort of like the academic kind of theology, is that there really isn't very much of it. <laughs> there, just, there just isn't over the years. And I'll give you a little bit of a, um, a visual on what I mean by that. Even going back to the beginning, brethren have never been very inclined to do a whole lot of formal academic theology. There's a guy named Menno Simons who lived about 200 years before the Brethren started. And Menno is the guy where the Mennonites get their name from. He wasn't the first Anabaptist, but he was uh, a major figure. Menno um, was wordy, as you can see. This is the complete collection of all of his writings. This is everything that Menno Simons wrote. And it is a big old book, particularly when you compare it with the complete writings of Alexander Mack, who was the founder of the Brethren, which looks like this. <laughs> now, believe me when I say in the grand scheme of, um, of everything with all the different denominations, Mennonites were not particularly wordy either, but brethren were even less wordy than, than the Mennonites, or at least they have tended to be 
over the years. And there's some interesting but very good reasons for this. One of which is that brethren have tended to reject all of the whole idea of doing that kind of formal academic theology. Because mainly they would say that all of that stuff just kind of gets in the way of our ability to just read the Scripture and to try and understand the Bible itself. One of the formative beliefs that the brethren have held for a very long time is a nice little phrase, which is that we have no creed except for the New Testament ourselves. Which means that if you ask a brethren what they believe, they have tended to say, well, we believe what's in the New Testament, and then just leave it at that. They haven't felt the need to expound on what that might mean. Their lack of theology comes from a fairly simple and straightforward reading of Scripture. It's an intentional choice to do it that way, but it is a very simple reading of Scripture. One of the major reasons why brethren have not, oh sorry, one of the main results of this approach to Scripture is that brethren have not really felt a need to write huge volumes of intellectual musings about Scripture, but instead we just simply try and read Scripture and do what it says, <laughs> is the other half of that. Which actually brings me to the second reason that brethren have not really created a lot of written theology over the years. There's a fairly strong case to be made that brethren, and other Anabaptists too, actually do have some fairly deep understandings of theology. It's just that we haven't done it through writing and through speaking. But rather, our theology is understood and expressed by action, by doing things. Our theology is a lived theology rather than a spoken or written theology. A big reason why our tradition has not really produced volumes of great theological writings is because we have this simple, straightforward approach to Scripture. And we have tended to be more concerned about how our faith shapes the actions that we take than we have been concerned about having a right set of beliefs. And I think in our Scripture for today, we can actually see this dynamic at work. We can see some foundations of where the brethren get this idea. We have two scriptures, both of which are talking about love in some form. The first of which is from the Gospel of John, where Jesus is talking about his relationship to the people of the world. You could make the argument that he's talking about just his followers, but, but Jesus was really opening that up to anybody and everybody who wanted to follow him, so he's really concerned with all people, I think. Nevertheless, Jesus is making an interesting analogy here. He's talking about his relationship with all people by talking about farming, <laughs> of all things. This is really just a farming analogy, something that would have been well known to very common people of the day. He talks about the relationship between sheep and their shepherd, and how that is a special and loving relationship, really. And he says that there are other people in this world who who don't have that relationship. Thieves will come in and try and do harm to the sheep. And even a hired hand doesn't have the same kind of relationship that the actual shepherd does. Now interestingly, partly, Jesus uses this analogy to say that other leaders, particularly the Jewish people, have really been like thieves and hired hands. And that they really don't care that much about the people. And when, and when the difficulty comes, or when the trials come, they will simply abandon the people. Jesus, however, says that he is the good shepherd. And the way that you know that he is the good shepherd is that he loves his sheep so much that he is willing to lay his life down for them. Now, this story comes in the middle of the Gospel of John, but we know that by the end of the story, Jesus makes good on that promise. He does eventually lay down his life for all people. Just like with the Good Shepherd, Jesus loves all people and will not abandon them when they need, when they need him the most. He will lay down his life for all people. When we ask what love really looks like in this scripture, that's what it looks like. It's a sentiment that's picked up again in the letter of 1 John. 1 John picks up this idea that Jesus has love 
for all people, has loved all people. But then the author goes on to say that because Jesus loved us, we should also love other people in the same way. After our scripture, in chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, it says this, In this is love. Not that we loved God, but rather that God loved us and sent His Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also should love one another. What's more, when 1 John talks about love, it's a love that's not just wordy. (laughs) It's not about nice sentiments. It's a love that is backed up with substance. In our scripture for today, chapter 3, verse 18, it says, Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. To love in action. Again, that's what love looks like in the letter of 1 John. Now again, I said the brethren had a fairly simple approach to Scripture. Simple and straightforward. And when you put these two Scriptures together, well, you get a very powerful yet very simple and straightforward message or or a straightforward message logic between these two scriptures which is this in the letter of first john it says that we should love others because jesus loved us first and the love that we should show is love in action not just in word and speech so what kind of actions did jesus do well he was willing to lay down his life for us and for others which means that if we are supposed to love people other people with the same kind of love and in the same way that jesus loved us well, that means we need to be willing to lay down our lives for others as well. The love that we are called to is the same kind of love that Jesus showed us, which is a self-sacrificing love. That's pretty much it. That's, that's the main message of this Scripture. Now where things get interesting <clears throat> is when we ask what that means for us today. And how do we apply that kind of message for for our world? And when we ask that question, I actually see two things for us to consider. The first of which is that, yes, there is a clear message here that loving Jesus means loving other people. And loving others requires concrete actions, particularly of service. And that, I think, is something that is fairly striking within our culture and maybe within some other Christian cultures that we see around us today. In the world today, it seems like expressions of love tend to be pretty heavy on words and sentiment and and a whole lot of show, but often are pretty thin on substance. It's really easy to say that we love someone. It's It's even easy to say that we love Jesus, but when it really comes down to it, What's that backed up with? Several weeks ago, we were looking at the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is teaching his disciples and his other followers what it means to follow him. And in chapter 7, we're towards the end of that sermon, Jesus addresses this issue. Jesus even says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. I mean, Jesus is saying in that scripture that saying you love Jesus isn't really quite enough. You actually have to do what he said. And doing what he said is that we should love other people in real and concrete kinds of ways. And that, I think, is a message that we all need to be reminded of from time to time. Following Jesus requires action. It's not just good enough to show up to church on Sunday morning and sing a few nice songs. There's more of a calling than that. It's a daily life kind of calling. Now, that being said, I will also say that I think the brethren have tended to have a pretty good handle on this kind of thing. This isn't fantastically new information for us. We've known that serving others is a core part of what it means to follow God. 
We've got a huge tradition of selfless serving that has made a huge impact on this world and has been a key expression of our faith. We've really spent a lot of time and energy on very selfless <laughs> actions. Although sometimes I wonder if we spent a lot of time and energy on those selfless actions and maybe lost sight of the first part of that equation. See, a key part of this scripture is remembering that lying, laying your life down for others or serving others, that's not where it actually starts. Those are all byproducts of the fact that you love someone first. I think the real calling of Christians in this scripture is not just to lay down our lives for others, but rather the calling is to love others and invest in others' lives to the point where laying down your life for them is a natural response, a natural thing to do. In some ways, it may actually be fairly easy to generously and selflessly give or serve someone else. But actually loving someone and getting involved in their life? Man, now that's hard. But in this scripture, isn't that what Jesus is calling us to? Now again, generally speaking, I think brethren do a pretty good job of this. But it's worth being attentive to this. And, and being aware of this. It is a great and honorable thing to serve one another. But that service has to start with love. And the reason that it has to start with love is because loving someone first drastically changes how you serve someone. This is something that, that I've seen on a whole different, uh, on all kinds of different levels of relationships here. Love is really highly dependent on the type of relationship that you have with someone. And the problem is that if you, if you don't have that relationship with, with someone, what often happens is that you wind up doing or, or giving something that you think they need instead of actually giving or doing what they really need. However, if you love someone and have a relationship with them, well, then you're much more likely to actually ask them <laughs> what they need and, and to talk with them which means you wind up responding in a more helpful kind of way. The kind of service that you do is shaped by your relationship with the person that you love. This is a reality that shows up in, in marriages, in friendships, in churches. I've even seen it show up in, in disaster responses. I mean, big international kind of stuff. Examples of that. Um, Several years ago, I ran across a story of some people who were doing some disaster relief, and I can't quite remember where exactly it was, whether it was Katrina or Haiti, and whether it was MCC or MDS or whatever it was. But the main point of the story is that there were some people who were on the ground working with people in the middle of this disaster and trying to coordinate supplies and all kinds of other things, and all of a sudden, a huge truckload <laughs> of clothes shows up which is all fine and good, except what they really needed in that moment was stuff like water and hygiene kits and, and a whole bunch of other things. They had plenty of clothes at that moment. Come to find out that what had happened was that there was a church group who, who wanted to do something, and so they organized a clothing drive and then just sent everything to this disaster area. But they didn't have any relationships. They didn't bother to ask what people really needed. It was an act of service, but they wound up doing what they thought they needed rather than what they actually needed. It just wasn't a response rooted in love and a relationship. Now, compare that to the Brethren Disaster Ministries' uh, response to Nigeria. I actually see something qualitatively different here. Yes, our church is wanting to respond. Our denomination is wanting to respond to the, the devastation that's happening in Nigeria. But the thing is, we, we have some fairly close and long-standing ties with that church, which means instead of just sending supplies over right away, we've taken the time to send representatives to actually talk with their leaders and to say, okay, what is the response. What can we do? What's the right thing to do? They've taken the time to work with 
the people they're serving, not just do service at them. And I think that's an important difference. It is different than some of these other major responses that happen. It's an act of service that's rooted in love and an ongoing relationship with the people that we're serving. Yes, we are called to serve others and give of ourselves in a selfless way, but that all really begins with love and having a relationship with the people that we're helping. A key part of the message of this scripture for us today is that we actually need to love people first. Love people first and then worry about serving them. Yes, our scripture ultimately leads us to selfless acts of service, but it starts by loving Jesus and by loving each other. And by the way, loving others also includes yourself. Yes, we're called to love our neighbors as ourselves, but that requires that we love ourselves first which is something that for a lot of brethren actually feels incredibly selfish. And we can hardly bring ourselves to care for ourselves sometimes because we wind up with huge amounts of guilt and thinking that, well, if we do anything for myself, I'm not doing enough, and then I, I feel selfish about that and I just can't do it. And believe me, I get that line of thinking. I'm related to a lot of people who function in that line of thinking. But it is still missing the point. And here's why. The calling of this scripture and of Jesus in general is a calling to serve others to the best of your ability. And the truth is that if you're not taking care of yourself, you're not able to serve to the best of your ability. Self-care is not about doing something selfish. Self-care is a way of making sure that you can do things for other people. It's a little bit like changing the oil in your car. You can drive a car long past the point where you should have changed the oil. But at some point, that car is going to break down. And when it does, it's going to be bad. The way that you get a car to go a really long ways is to continually to care for it and to make sure that things like the oil are changed regularly. I think self-care is essentially making sure that you're taking the time to change the oil in your engine so that you can keep going for the long haul. The scripture this morning, I think, turns out to be a lot like some of the things that Jesus said. It's a really simple and straightforward thing to understand, but it's really difficult to live out. Jesus loves the whole world including us. And he was willing to give up his whole life for everyone. And in response, we're called to love people in the same kind of way. Figuring out what that means and actually doing it, uh, well, there's the challenge of a lifetime. As we enter in, into our time of reflection this morning, I'll leave you with a few questions to ponder. They are printed in your bulletin if you would like to be able to read them as well. When we ask what it means to serve others selflessly, it's worth asking the question of, for each of us to ask the questions, well, who is it exactly that you are being called to love? Who is it in your life in this community, in this world, that you are being called to love? And then what does it mean to serve them to the best of your ability? And how does your relationship with them change the way that you serve them?